My name is Brianna Walker and I'm with the Union County uh, Wildlife Chapter. And tonight we have with us um, Mr. Scott Fletcher. And Scott is currently the manager of natural resources and a certified wildlife biologist with Duke Energy's Environmental Services Department. He's served um, 35 years of or he has 35 years of experience in wildlife assessment, endangered species, avian protection, wetlands, environmental impact analysis and assessments, as well as natural resource policy. Um, Scott and his wife, Anne, and two children have lived in Huntersville for the last um, 20 years, and Scott enjoys fly fishing, hunting, backpacking, and trail running through um, throughout North Carolina and the rest of the country. Um, so I will go ahead and turn it over to Scott um, for to do his presentation on avian migration. Um, but just really quick, if anyone is new and they didn't hear us earlier, um, as we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, um, you can put them in the chat box. It should be just, it's in that upper right hand corner, just to the left of um, the time. So you should see a picture of yourself the time and then a little chat box um, and we'll be answering those throughout the presentation um, and just remember keep your microphones turned off so that we don't get feedback do you want to add anything before we begin tara <laughs> nope i think that sounds perfect thanks brianna we can get rolling all right you're up scott all right um can you hear me okay yes very good. Th thanks, Brianna. Thanks, Tara. Um, and uh, good evening, everybody. It's uh, I was going to say good to see you, but um, good good to be here tonight. I'm glad you all could join us. And uh, um, just to add on to that introduction, and thank you for that, uh, Brianna. I'm also the, a member of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation and um, grateful to be one of the board members on the board of directors for them. So. Um, as you know, wonderful organization and for habitat conservation stewardship projects, uh, outdoor education. It's just a wonderful organization. Actually, one of the, I've been in, involved in a lot of uh, environmental and natural resource organizations, and uh, North Carolina Wildlife Federation is the is top notch in my book. Um, best one I've ever served on and, and been been a member of. So glad you guys are also members and, and uh, reaping the benefits of, of, of membership and all the wonderful projects and habitat um, stewardship that the organization does. So, so to start out, um, we're gonna be talking about avian migration tonight and uh, somewhat in the specific to the Charlotte area. And, um, you know, it's just a fascinating topic um, and phenomena we're going to talk about some, hopefully, some facts that you may may know, and some that you may not know. But I've been uh, I've been interested in birds. I'm a wildlife biologist, as Brianna said, and I've been interested in birds since my parents said since I was like three years old, and I still have one of one of the first Peterson guide I ever had. It's all kind of beat up and water worn and stained, but I still have that. It's probably forty. 40 some years old now. So, um, so we're gonna talk about this phenomena and feel free after each slide. I know um, Tara mentioned the um, chat function, but also feel free, I'm gonna stop at each slide, end of, end of each slide and you're welcome to ask any questions or ask any other information you'd like. So, so let's start off. Um, make sure I got the right. Yeah, there you go. Um, so first of all, just give a little perspective of um, where we sit as far as migration, at somewhat the regional level. Um, I'm showing you the uh, Catawba Watery Basin. So the Catawba River, which flows through Charlotte and, and down through South, you know, South Carolina, starts up, you know, north, um, the, the old fort area as you drive on I-40 going up to Asheville and runs through several um, reservoirs all under the jurisdiction of Duke Energy for hydropower, et cetera, from Lake James all the way down to um, across the border and all the way down 
to the uh, Lake Watery and the Watery River, um, which is near the Kershaw area in South Carolina, and eventually drains into Marion, Lake Marion, Lake Moultrie, and on into the Santee River and out to the to the Atlantic Ocean. So the basin itself is marked in the red. So everything that within that red basin drains into the Catawba and Watery Rivers, all right? So it's a fairly large area, goes all the way from the mountains and foothills all the way down through Gastonia, um, Eastern Mecklenburg County, Union County, where you guys are, and then down through, you know, um, parallel in the Broad River near um, um, just uh, east of Gaffney, and then down through the Kershaw, east of Columbia, and again down into uh, uh, Lake Marion. So why is that important? And we're going to be talking about it, is one of the main reasons is um, it's one of the primary water bodies, water sources in this part of the country. Important, one, because a lot of birds are um, associated with water one way or the other. And also it's um, got some fairly large air, riparian areas and bottomland hardwoods, which form the habitat for quite a few birds. And it also is um, a landmark. So we're going to talk about landmarks in a, in a couple slides. All right. Any any questions on that? We'll talk about how this fits into the flyway and um, the migratory pathways in a minute. Okay. Yeah. So, no questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks, Tara. So let's let's give you a little background. What exactly is avian or bird migration? And avian is just a fancy word for birds that biologists use. So just interchange bird and avian and you'll be okay. So that is basically any movement of a bird from one area to the to the to another. And as a rule, it is it is a response to changes in the environment, environmental conditions, weather conditions, food availability, amount of daylight hours. Um, it, it has evolved as a way to exploit resources such as food and habitat, and avoid times and places where food is scarce or weather is severe. So think about, you know, locally, when you see hummingbirds and when you don't, all right? So hummingbirds start to show up and say, up here in Huntersville, I usually get them about May 4th, almost on the dot, and they're typically gone by, say, October 4th, all right? So that corresponds to food, that's when the insects start to appear uh, or are appearing and when there is um, um, flowering plants which they feed on feed on the nectar so food food related it's also um, weather related obviously so um, tropical neotropical birds those that winter in the tropics south america caribbean Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and breed in the uh, in, in North America are called neotropical migrants. All right, so they migrate based a lot on weather and and food. All right, you see a picture of the scarlet tanager on the right. So you know he breeds up that bird breeds up in um, northern and eastern uh, North America and winters down in the Amazon basin in South America. So we're gonna be talking about these kind of pathways, but that's a prime example of a neotropical uh, migrant. Um, birds also migrate to avoid predators. And we're gonna talk about a good group of birds actually migrate at night, all right? Good reason for that. There are no hawks and no eagles no predators out there flying or at flying at night, so it's safer. And they also pass and migrate in cooler temperatures, you know, spring and fall, which is um, a physio physiological function that it's much more efficient use of oxygen in cooler temperatures. So think about, you know, if you're a runner or a jogger or even a walker, is it a lot easier to do that when it's um, 90 degrees and 
um, 94% humidity. You know, you're kind of sucking wind, at least I do when I run when it's that hot, literally sucking wind. Or is it, um, are you much better, feel much better when it's like, say, 65 and uh, a humidity, relative humidity of about, you know, 70 or so, or 65%. So think about that. So a lot of birds migrate at night because it's cooler and they can assimilate oxygen and use oxygen much better. And then the Germans call um, migratory restlessness Zugenru, and that's a physiological process influenced by the pituitary gland and is stimulated by day lengths. So the Germans, which are usually on top of a lot of things on science, um, notice they did some experiments with white-throated sparrows. And if you feed birds, you got white-throated sparrows in your backyard probably right now. And some early scientists in the early 1900s kind of noticed that um, certain caged birds were got really restless at certain times of the year. So they did an experiment and they put several white-throated sparrows in a, in a box, circular box, open to the kind of, so the sunlight could come in, the daylight, and they um, put um, wood, black wood ash on their feet. So e as the day went on, um, certain times of the year, they could notice different movements, all right? So during the summer, the birds pretty much just had kind of random patterns. And that showed up on the white sides of the box because of the of the uh, the uh, um, charcoal on their feet. But as it approached the fall, they started to notice that the birds started to orient in one direction of the box, and all their footprints were all on one side of the box. And that way, and that direction was south. So they kind of figured this migratory restlessness is what they called it, as the as the daylight decreased. And they started to get this restlessness to start moving and start migrating. They started to orient to that side of the box. And so then they tried in the spring and they noticed that the same thing, but the opposite direction, they were oriented to the north. All right. So that gives you a little background on just a, a brief, uh, the, the physiological process that goes into this, into migration. All right. It's innate. It's genetic. Um, no father or mother bird teaches their young this. It's all built into the brain, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So, so very interesting. Any, any questions on that one? All right, let's move on to the next one. So let, let's talk about the, the types of avian migration. So I talked about the ne neotropical migrants. So that's defined as a complete or long distance migration, meaning that, like I said, birds breed in North America, the United States, Canada, Alaska, and migrate in winter in the Caribbean, Mexico, South America, all right? Very long distance, and we're gonna give some examples of that, how long that is and what, what that takes to, for a, a little mite of a bird that weighs no more than two quarters, um, how extraordinary it is for these birds to migrate. But um, the, one of the examples on the right, a yellow warbler. So we have yellow warblers here, very beautiful bird. Um, they like shrubby wetlands, um, you know, mostly toward the mountain, the mountains, uh, Blue Ridge section of North Carolina, but they're found all through North Carolina. I see them in Huntersville quite a bit, um, just behind my house here. Um, most long distance or, or complete migrants migrate at night for the reasons I, I mentioned, uh, lack of predators um, and um, much more efficient as far as flight and migration. Then you have partial or short distance migrants, um, dark-eyed junco, we got those in the backyard right now. They came typically um, you know, around November uh, early November, I started to see them flying around, and they actually do breed in, in North Carolina, but mostly up in the mountains. Uh, Yellow-billed sapsuckers, um, another partial short-distance migrant, 
they also breed up in you know the grandfather mountain higher elevation areas in north carolina usually above 3,000 feet um pine siskins the same um they also breed in north carolina but at much higher elevations than we have here at about 740 feet um, in elevation. And partial short, di short distance migrants are both night and day migrants, depending on the group and the species. Most sparrow-like birds, juncos, white-throated sparrows um, are, are night migrants. And then others like woodpeckers, like the sapsucker, are um migrate during the day all right so and then the third group is called eruptive migrants now we don't always see those those are all most mostly boreal um breeding birds up in the spruce fir forests of maine new york um new england maritime provinces of canada and up through alaska and those birds include evening grosbeaks and the winter finches, such as um, uh, purple finch, red poles, and then also red-breasted nuthatches and other birds that are seen at the coast, like sometimes snowy owls and uh, the rough leg hawk, all right? Um, this may or may not be a good year. Last year was pretty poor for eruptive migrations, although this year may be a little different for one reason or the other, though it's been pretty warm in most of the uh, um, eastern part of the United States. Um, I did see some reports of some evening gross beaks up in um, uh, Iredell County. And I already saw a purple finch at my bird feeder and been hearing a bunch of red-breasted nuthatches at the uh, Latta Nature Preserve when I've been running. So... There's a few around right now, so who knows? We may even get some evening gross beaks um, coming down your way. So um, if you have uh, put sunflower seeds out, those evening gross beaks can wipe you out. They're, they're usually in large flocks. They'll wipe you out in about an hour. They're, they're pretty fairly large birds about the size of a starling. And when I went to school up in Maine, um, they were pretty common up there. Very beautiful bird, and to the, to the right of, of that, um, you can see a, the, the picture of an evening gross beak. So, um, and then certain years, we even get some snowy owls down this way. Um, three years ago, the airports from, they like open areas that are very similar to the tundra, where they, the treeless tundra, where they, where they breed up in Alaska and northern Canada. And they love airports. So a few years ago, they had some at Charlotte Douglas Airport. Um, they had them in Wilmington. The Outer Banks had a bunch. So I don't know if anybody's ever seen a snowy owl, but it's a magnificent bird. And who knows, you, you may get one down this way someday. So um, if you want to, everyone has look at some rare bird alerts, just um, get into the Carolina Bird Club and look at their sightings. Just Google Carolina Bird Club and look at sightings and they give you a list of where all the bird, rare birds sightings were for both North and South Carolina. So, so those are kind of the three different types of avian migration. Uh, any, any questions on that? Um, All right. Scott, this yep. is Brianna. It looks like somebody raised their hand. So I'm not sure if the, if the person who raised their hand had a question, I didn't catch who it was. Yeah, sure. Any, anybody just, Chime in if you do. You can take it off mute if you need to, or um, again, don't forget that you can put questions in the chat. We'll get through okay. this uh, COVID deal. We'll get face to face one of these days, but um, I think everybody's getting a feel how to do these team, these uh, Google and Teams meetings pretty well. So, so feel free to jump in either way. All right, let's let's get into the science part of this and some of the more fascinating um, facets behind my avian migration. How do they how do they migrate and how do they find their way? So scientists have been studying bird migration for hundreds of years, 
Uh, even the, the Romans and the Greeks were, were fascinated by it. And, but relatively recently, last couple of decades, um, with our technology and, and um, high-powered science, we've, we've started to figure out some of the complex sets, set of multi-factors that go into avian migration, all right? So we're going to talk about a few here. So one of the more interesting and the primary um, factor in, in why and how birds migrate, how they find their way, is that they use the magnetic and, and geomagnetic and gravitational clues that the Earth throws off. So just quickly, and, you, and to the right is the, is the 2010 map of the World Magnetic Model. So um, each one of those um, isoplasts or lines are, are um, different uh, intensities of the magnetic, magnetic field. And just quickly, the magnetic field is all based on um, the, the, the magnetic, magnetic field generated from the outer core, the, um, the nickel and iron that, that's in the core. All right, so relatively static as far as the fields, although they, they, it does change um, slightly in some areas a little, a little um, more significant. But um, the fascinating thing about, so you think, well, how does that, how does a bird actually know what the magnetic field is? All right, and how do they use that? Well, they found out that all these migrants have a, microscopic fleck of magnetite, an iron-based uh, mineral in their brain, all right? So they basically have, just like a compass, they have an internal compass in their brain. So that helps them use those magnetic fields as a map, all right? So you can see North America is on that upper um, northwest quadrant there. You can just barely make out that the, the shape of the earth, or, or I'm sorry, of North America, South America. And so you can see how the fields lie um, almost in a perfect uh, manner for them to use and migrate through North America down to South America and, and fairly close to the same up in Europe and Africa also, all right? So they're, they're magnetic waves that they follow and use to get from North to South and South to North, all right? The second way they, they do, and this is kind of to augment the magnetic fields, is they also use polarized and UV light, the polarized and UV light plane to calibrate their magnetic compass, all right? And this comes into play. Polarized light is most apparent for a lot of wildlife, including birds, at sunrise and sunset. And that's exactly when the birds are either completing their mi migration for the day um, or starting it, all right? So um, they use that to calibrate that, that magnetic compass. We don't see, humans can't see polarized light nor UV light. And I'll give you an example of UV light that they, um, they just figured out and found out um, just a couple years ago. They were doing um, telemetry work, um, GPS work on golden eagles out west, out in Wyoming. And um, they were kind of fascinated because these eagles were flying these straight paths. No, no prey was available. And then all of a sudden they dive down and pick up a jackrabbit or pick up a, a wood rat or something. And they realized that the golden eagles were following the UV light that's coming off the the urine trails, believe it or not, of these rodents. So they were using these trails and the pathway that these rodents were using as basically the billboard, the highway to the billboard and catching those, those animals for, for food, foraging for food. So they kind of realized, man, wildlife and, and birds in general are so sophisticated in the use of polarized and UV light that we, we never even knew that, all right? So interesting uh, phenomena for sure. And then we get into the more um, traditional 
um, ways bird mi birds migrate that people have known for quite a long time is that they use celestial clues, and that's the setting sun and the star map, all right? And, you know, as you know, um, the star map changes um, by season, especially. So they use those as um, part of that road map, all right, especially on clear days. And um, which is important because I'm, uh, we're going to talk about how weather relates. So clear days, keep that in your mind. That, that's important. And then they also, like I, I mentioned, the, the Catawba River. They also use topography and geography and wind currents, large water bodies, you know, the, the coast of, of uh, North Carolina coast, um, the coast of the Great Lakes, shoreline of the Great Lakes, the Appalachian Mountains, uh, mountain ridges, islands as um, the physical roadmap, all right? They just know where to go. They, they follow that they've been following these these road maps for million, millions of years, and it's basically an innate um, uh, pathway for them, all right? I grew up in Pennsylvania, as you can tell with my Yankee accent, and always, every year, my family and I would go to Hawk Mountain, which is um, one of the premier hawk migration routes um, in, in uh, the Eastern United States, if not the, the North America. And you could watch how these raptors, hawks, eagles, falcons, use the top of the ridges and the air currents coming off of them for, for migration and literally fly in, you know, 60 miles an hour, um, just wind, wings folded back and just using that, those highways as migratory pathways. So, um, so those are the, you know, the, the five, um, or so factors that birds use to migrate. And I always kind of throw in a good prayer because if you're migrating, a, you know, even a couple hundred miles, not let alone thousands of miles, you probably need a good, some, somebody looking after you doing that. And probably a good prayer would be helpful um, to get from point A to point B and everything that's in between it, between, you know, weather, rough weather and, and rough terrain and predators and, buildings, you know, um, you name it. So, so pretty fascinating. And uh, just checking it. Anybody, any questions on that one? We still don't have any questions. <laughs> okay. So, so you get a feel how, how incredible this phenomena is already and how incredible these small birds, these tiny mites of a bird, what they can do and how they do it. Um, much more, I'll just say, a lot more sophisticated to us. Um, I can just tell you, I know quite a few people that have trouble um, driving from, from here to downtown Charlotte, let alone um, from uh, the coast of Maine down to the um, Peruvian jungle, you know. So it's just an incredible ph phenomenon when you start to think about it. All right, let's... Let's talk about weather and how weather affects migration. So, so there's a, a strong association between bird movement and weather conditions. You know, the, the typical factors, barometric pressure, temperature, wind direction, speed. And a rule of thumb, fall migration, and that, that can start for some species like swallows, purple martins in August, some warblers. Even even end of July, if you're up in the northern uh, northern states like Maine or or Vermont, and it's triggered by a cold front, typically the first strong cold front, and the highest the peak migratory period behind a cold front is about three days. All right. In spring, it's the total opposite. It's the passage of a warm front, and then the next three days after that. So. You can, you can see my map. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Um, can, can you see my cursor okay, Tara, or or not? Um, this is but yes, you can. You can see the cursor. Okay, good. All right. So I, I clipped out a map that I had, and this is basically um, out, out in the Midwest, Kansas and Nebraska, but it kind of is a good illustration of this phenomenon. So as you know, warm fronts, 
um, and, and a high pressure, um, the uh, wind currents, the direction is clockwise, all right? So, so think about that. Warm front passes through, say, in April, all right? Front goes through. Look at the direction of the wind, all right? It's going from the south through the north or southwest to, to northeast, all right? Prime highway, prime direction for a bird to efficiently, efficiently fly, all right? They don't have to do a whole lot of flapping because the wind is pretty much driving them in that direction, okay? Then think about a cold front. Cold front sweeps through on both on both fronts. You know, you typically have poor weather. All right, you got rain, you got high winds, you got snow, you got ice. Not really good um, flying weather if you're a bird. Too many things could happen. Too rough, too difficult, too much flapping, too much energy. All right, cold front. So when you have a low pressure just like a hurricane or a storm, um, winds are going in a counterclockwise met, um, fashion, all right? So the front goes through, passes through, winds are still going in a counterclockwise motion. Look what direction they're going. Basically from the north down to the south or northeast to the southeast. Prime up here, way up here is Canada, Maine, New York State. Um, Way down here is Mexico, South America, Yucatan Peninsula, perfect highway, all right? And then you got in between fronts. So warm front goes through, you got three days, birds are really flying, you get to the fourth, fifth day, maybe the, a week, and no wind, just kind of in the doldrums, not much happening. So typically in migration, this is the period that birds, as they're moving south or moving north, are kind of just hunkered down, just feeding, all right? Looking for insects, beefing up their fat contents. Um, you know, that's the time, a lot of times, where you see them in the oak trees in your backyard or on the on Lake Norman or in the ponds, just, just beefing up with fish or insects or berries or nectar waiting for that next passage of the front to go through. Front goes through, lousy weather, they're hunkered down, gets, you know, all the bad weather clears out, the temperatures drop, barometric pressure goes up, and the sky's clear, and they're starting to move one way or the other. So, so think about that. Do you do any bird walks, spring or fall? Wait till the front passes, you get through all that nasty, Um, after that front goes through, all right? So just kind of keep that in mind. Three days, front goes through, next three days are prime, all right? And then I just I just have a little table that pretty much just describes what I talked talked about, all right? So here you have um, the weather pattern. Let's kind of start from the left, go to the right. I'm, I'm sorry, go from the right to the left. And, you know, here's, here's the uh, ahead of the warm front, you know, a little... You know, not great, but the front's coming through, and you can see um, down here, spring and fall, that that uh, migration is either beginning on a warm front, and on the cold front, it's um, in full force, all right? So here's all the weather factors. You know, front goes through, cloudy, rainy. Front comes through on the cold front, rainy, heavy rain, could be... Could be rain, could be snow. And just kind of think, here's the front, migration stops. Here's the front, warm front, migration, no migration, all right? So just kind of give you a little, um, let me get that bar out of there, oops, sorry. Just give you a little idea uh, how how important weather elements are to, um, to migration, all right? So again, rule of thumb, Front goes through, weather clears up, that's the next three days or when you're gonna be, wanna go out and do your bird walks or 
go out in your backyard with the binoculars and see what's what's basically falling out of the sky and, and moving. All right. So I know that's a lot of information on that, but any, any questions on that on weather? All right. Good enough. Let's talk about now we talked about the Catawba River. But in the big picture, let's talk about the avian migration routes through North America, all right? So we're here, here's Charlotte, tip of that arrow, as you know. So you have basically four migratory bird flyways in North America. You have the Atlantic Flyway, which basically goes from Florida, Georgia, all the way up to the maritime provinces in, in Canada, Nova Scotia, Quebec, um, New Brunswick, Ontario, a little bit of Ontario. All right, that's where we are. Or so most of the birds migrate either along the coast or they migrate along the boundary, which is the Appalachian Mountains. All right, Blue Ridge in our case, but most of the Appalachian Mountains in uh, from Maine down to Georgia. All right, those are the peak areas for migration in the Atlantic Flyway. We are somewhere obviously in the middle. So our migration is okay, but not quite as good as you would have say in Asheville or Madison or Franklin, and not as good as you would have in Duck or Moorhead City or Wilmington, all right, for certain species. Next flyway over is the Mississippi Flyway, and that obviously called because it's bisect by the Mississippi River. Um, that's uh, another major migratory pathway, especially for waterfowl. Um, a lot of birds, waterfowl breed up in Canada, boreal, um, boreal Canada, and the upper edges of Minnesota and Michigan, and migrate down the Mississippi um, River and the general drainages down to Louisiana, um, Alabama, Mississippi, et cetera, all right? So some of those areas have, Arkansas, have very large populations of wintering waterfowl and, you know, mallards and snow geese and pintails, you name it, um, woodcock. Um, if you know what a woodcock is, they also use um, Mississippi Flyway, breed up in this area, and there's just, um, especially, um, 10 years ago, they're a little less now, but used to have hundreds of thousands of woodcock down here using the Mississippi Flyway. Next flyway going west is the Central Flyway. All right, this is basically from um, Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula, Costa Rica, Belize, all the way up to um, the northern reaches of Canada. And um, I don't know if anybody have ever heard the prairie pothole area or, or as it's known, the duck factory of the of the United States, of the North America. But there are just thousands of small little um, glaciated glacier made ponds all up in here. North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, um, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, all these areas here are major waterfowl breeding areas and a bunch of shorebirds also. So a lot of waterfowl and shorebirds also use this central flyway um, to get to migrate down and winter on the Gulf Coast or down in Mexico or, or farther down in Central America. And then the last on the west end is the Pacific flyway, another very significant flyway that basically goes from Mexico and the Baja all the way up through the Yukon and up through Alaska. And Alaska uh, is a major, if anybody's been to Alaska, you know, in the summer, there's all kinds of shorebirds and waterfowl and a lot of different migrants that use, that breed up in Alaska and basically fly down that Pacific Flyway. Um, and winter, mostly down in the California area, you got, you know, tons of waterfowl species, geese, um, a lot of different birds um, use this uh, this this Pacific um, flyway uh, as uh, shorebirds, especially as a migratory pathway. All right, so 
So those are the four um, major North, um, North American migratory bird pathways that, that, that are all well used, especially, especially, you know, the Atlantic, the, well, they are, you can't really compare them really. They're all very important flyways for certain species and whole groups of species. Any, any questions on that? Okay. Oh, I think we do have a question. Oh, okay. Um, is the border between the Central Flyway and the Pacific Flyway the Colorado River? Uh, pretty close. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, you can actually see how it kind of intertwines there, right? Kind of convoluted. So, yeah, exactly. Very good. So, again, a water body, right? Um. And you, know, you can notice the Mississippi River is right central to that flyway. So, and all the you know Missouri going in there, you know, um, the Ohio, they're all tributaries of that. So they're all like micro or um, smaller flyway pathways. So rivers are exactly that's exactly right. A very good um, landmark for birds to use. So very good. Yeah, good question. So let's drill down to a little bit um, finer, some of the, um, on the Atlantic side, some of the migration routes, all right? So here's some fairly common migrants, Baltimore Oriole, not so common, Cerulean Warbler. Um, we have, they breed in North Carolina, mostly in the Roanoke River Basin. Um, they migrate through here. I've seen one or two in the backyard last couple of years, but most of them breed up like up in the Nantahala area. Up in, they like um, nice mountain cove forest areas, rich, wet. Um, I've done surveys up on Nantahala Lake, if anybody knows where that is, up by Robbinsville, up in that area. Um, Almond, Appleton, um, I've um, seen quite a few up there breeding. They're relatively rare, but they're actually um, holding on and doing doing better for, for a couple reasons. And then again, they also found in the Roanoke River Basin, all right? So um, Roanoke River National Wildlife Refuge has quite a few on there and Game Lands has quite a few um, of the bottomland kind of coastal plain variety. And then, you know, you got the ruby-throated hummingbird, all right? So as I mentioned, um, one of the pathways is a lot of birds, neotropical birds, winter, Peruvian and the Amazonian basin. All right, Yucatan Peninsula, Costa Rica, Belize, Mexico, and a lot of them, you know, they jump off from the Yucatan and fly from 600 to 800 miles without stopping across that Gulf of Mexico. All right, so think about that. 600 miles is about from here, from Charlotte to Chicago. They're doing that nonstop, all right? Think of if you've driven to Chicago, and I have, my wife and I have, because we've got family up there. That's a long way. That, that takes a, a long day of driving, going 65 miles an hour, all right? Um, birds do that nonstop. You know, we got to stop at McDonald's or the roadside rest or um, the, to get fuel or both for the car and to eat take a rest, walk around, do whatever you got to do. A bird does it nonstop. They can't stop. They can't go, well, I think I'm kind of tired. I'm just going to take a break and land on the on the golf. Doesn't work. They're, they're not going to make it. So take a deep breath, say a prayer, and take off. Fly that 600 to 800 miles. And a lot of them, um, if you go down to the, the um, Chandelier Islands, and um, the coast of, of Louisiana, Alabama, and Texas in the spring, like in April, there's they call it fallout because literally these birds are so tired. Think about it again, 600 to 800 miles. They, they see that land and they literally fall in, in these um, coastal barrier island habitats, scrubby. You know, it's kind of like... Um, uh, what is that outside of duck? If you've been to duck, North Carolina, the maritime forest, you know, with the, with the oaks, live oaks and, 
and uh, hollies and and uh, all those kind of uh, coastal shrubs. That's exactly where they land. And it's usually rich in food, a lot of insects, um, waxy berries that they can feed on, but they're literally falling out of the sky. I used to do um, bird tours up on some of the islands off of Maine for the Maine Audubon Society. And we'd go there in the fall and you know, these islands were 30 miles, say, off the coast of Maine. And it was incredible. The, the beaches and the rocky shores would be littered with birds that are just exhausted because they came down from Florida, or um, Florida, came down from Canada, and they saw the first place to land, and they landed. And um, it's incredible to see that all these, all different species of birds just laying on the on the uh, ground, just trying to get their energy back up. Um, and you've also, I don't, know, I don't know if you've read, but ships off the coast of, of, of the Atlantic sometimes get thousands of birds land on them, all right? The birds are kind of see something to land on and they're all landing, all these different variety species of birds are landing on these big tankers and cruise ships. So, um, so anyway, just to show you, a lot of energy to fly across this. Um, six to 800 miles, fly across the Gulf. Some actually go up on the land side, up through Texas. Um, that's a common route for say broad wing hawks that, that, that nest in this area, in the mountains. They prefer to land, raptors prefer the land route and they go through Texas and down into, into Mexico. But a lot of the neotropicals um, take off from the Yucatan, some may go from South America up to the Caribbean islands, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Haiti, and the Bahamas. Had a short stop there and then take another short stop over in Cuba, over to Florida and move up, up, up that route up to North Carolina or Pennsylvania or Maine, all right? So, so just kind of give you a little perspective of what that route, all the different routes for, for different species, all right? So you can see the Northeast, way up the main, southeast, you know, our area, central, central east, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, and then you got more of a Midwest route heading up to the Great Lakes area or up to, uh, up to Canada, et cetera. So just put things in perspective, but I did want to tell you about that gap between Mexico and say Louisiana six to 800 miles nonstop. So, you know, just keep that in perspective of how um, fat, how difficult that could be. Um, and, you know, I just read an article, believe it or not, um, they were, some fishermen were fishing for sharks off um, Alabama and um, they were taking them home and, and uh, to eat. And when they would clean them out, they were just stuffed with migratory birds and what happened is they, the scientists figured out that there was a, a, a hurricane, a bad storm came through and the birds didn't make it. They drowned, got pushed in, they drowned and the sharks were eating them. And they were just stuffed with all different types of warblers and thrushes and um, some other species. And the reason why is those birds had perished. They just had bad luck didn't say their prayers and um, got hit by that storm and didn't make it. So you can, you can think about, you know, some of the hardships that these birds go through one way or the other. And it's sometimes it's just luck that there's a st storm or not. So pretty, pretty fascinating. So any, any, anybody, any questions on that one? Um, we do have one question. Uh, two years Great. ago, this is from Karen Andre. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, she says two years ago, I had a lot of blue jays eat my peanuts in the spring in the, <clears throat> sorry, in the Concord area. Um, last year I had none. Why would that be? Oh, that's a good, good, good question, Karen. So, um, could be a couple reasons, but believe it or not, blue jays are also short, short, uh, migrants. Um, blue jays say from New York or Pennsylvania actually winter down in this part of the country. We also have permanent residents that stay stay here all year. But they, you know, blue jays, you know, they, they tend to be, you tend to see them in flocks or small groups, kind of family groups. I, I just saw some in the backyard today, about five or six that come every day. 
and it's all associated with food. So um, even though you're putting a lot of food out, they may be going to different food sources. Um, that population is not declining. Blue Jays are fairly um, adaptable. So it, it could be food related or it could be just that a group was there all winter that was from up north and just decided to, to go someplace else. So a good question though. All right, let's give you another example of the best um, avian migra migration periods in this part of the country in the mountains. So like I said, you wanna go out, we talked about the fronts, um, spring migration, peak times are from April 1 um, to about, until about May 30th, all right? And typically the peak, I mean, that's the, the period, the peak runs about from the 10th through about May 15th, all right? So, so you got, you got, you know, you got two, more than two months in there, uh, good spring migration. And that mostly includes everything from um, warblers, the thrushes, um, hummingbirds, of course, are in there, swallows, all those neotropical migrants are passing through and some staying during that, that period, all right? April 1 through May 30th. Fall mi migration in this area is typically from about August 15th through about October 30th, all right? For most like neotropical migrants, small songbirds, Peak is about September 10th through about October 15th, all right? So remember what I said about the hummingbird. I usually see them about May 4th come to my feeders. It may vary in your, where you are. Um, and then I, they typically leave by the latest, October 4th, October 7th, all right? Then you got water birds or water fowl, um, loons, common loons on Lake Norman or Lake Wiley, um, double-grested cormorants on those large reservoirs, uh, waterfowl like buffleheads or scalp. Um, all those birds typically arrive from up north in about October. So you start to see some ice forming in some of the lakes up in New England or mid-Atlantic states. Um, that's when the birds start to leave, when they they lose their open water, all right? So the peak is typically through October, from October through about, you know, I have December on here, but it could be in, into January in a lot of cases, and sometimes February or March. But most of them um, are gone by March, all the wintering birds, especially like the large flocks of gulls, ring barrel gulls, herring gulls, Bonaparte's gulls, which we'll talk about a little bit, uh, loons. Quite a few loons on our reservoirs now. Matter of fact, the, the Lake Norman Wildlife Conservationists do a loon, uh, winter loon, a couple of winter loon tours on Lake Norman. So keep your eyes out if you want to go out on a tour. They, they do a great job and you can see thousands of uh, ring bill galls and Bonaparte's galls, common loons, of course, um, horned grebes, sometimes red breasted grebes, bald eagles. So keep your eyes open for those tours. I, I don't know because of the virus if they're going to have any, but uh, this year, maybe Tara knows, but um, they typically, in during normal times, there's, there's, they run a couple tours on that. So just keep your eyes open. Great waterfowl tours, but you can go anywhere. You can go on the shoreline of Wiley. You can go to some, um, some of our uh, Mecklenburg County parks, Union County parks. I know you guys have some lakes down there, small lakes. You can see wintering waterfowl all through those, all right? And just quickly, here's just a kind of a, a little more annotated map of purple martins, which if you live along some of those large water bodies, put up a house, you'll get, you'll get pur purple martins pretty quickly. So you can see they, they all winter down in the Amazon basin again and um, typically either fly up through the land mass, like I talked about earlier, or... They do that jumping across the Gulf or the Caribbean islands. So they typically leave North, um, North Carolina and you'll see very large flocks. Actually, some of the bridges that are going over to the Outer Banks or, or roosting areas form and there's thousands of them. So they typically leave 
you know, August, September, wait a couple months, get that restlessness and then start winging, working their way up and typically get to the Gulf Coast at about, you know, in about a month from now, January 15th. And they just start, you know, every, you know, 15 days, 20 days, they, they're just slowly moving up the, um, up, up through North America, um, stop a place, rest, feed, wait for the insects, wait till the leaves start coming out, start moving up, up through these various states at these various times, all right? So you can see a bird that gets to, say, Louisiana on January 15th, once they get up to May, or I'm sorry, once they get to Maine, they're finally up there in May 1st, all right? Breed, nest, raise their long, young, and in two and a half months, they're ready to go back down, you know, or at least staging and roosting. Same thing on the Pacific coast. You can see some populations go up through um, California mid-March, get up to Oregon, Washington in April, and go all the way up to like British Columbia, for instance, by May. All right. Fairly similar latitude as, as, uh, as New England, as it Maine is, all right? So to just give you a little perspective of that kind of leapfrogging that a lot of migrants do, and this is just a good example of where they winter and where how they move up based on weather conditions, based on food availability, and purple martins are totally, for the most part, uh, insect eaters, insectivores, um, eating moths and flies and um, dipterins, flies um and and in the winter they'll you know in migration they will eat like wax myrtle berries and some of the waxy um holly berries but for the most part they're they're insect eaters all right so they can't really afford to be booking up the main in march because there's nothing to eat too severe for them so again got that kind of leapfrog um skipping pattern that takes quite a few months all right so you know but five months basically four and a half months just to get from the gulf up to say maine canada all right so any any questions on that pretty pretty interesting stuff i don't think we have any questions on that scott but there was one question um about hummingbirds and the question is, how do hummingbirds muster enough energy to migrate? From my understanding, hummingbirds expend most of the energy they are able to acquire each day. That That is very good. So that's a good question. So if, if you feed hummingbirds, you notice that they're pretty lean machines, say, in July, right? They're buzzing around real quick, um, you know, uh, foraging on your flowers, um, nesting, you know, there's usually a period in June where you don't even see them because they're nesting and mostly eating insects. But, you know, start, you know, getting to July, June, late June, July, you start to start to pick them up and then you get into the, you know, August and September, they're all over the place. Well, you'll notice you get to about September, it looks like they're starting to bulk up a little bit, all right? Um, getting a little fatter, um, not quite as agile still very agile but not as quite as as lean machines as they were and then you get into about late september and you look at them and you just got to laugh because they look like they've just put on equivalent about 30 pounds and basically they have so what they what they have done and and like you said hummingbirds all birds but certainly hummingbirds expend tremendous amount of energy you know they're their wing beats are unbelievable. Their heartbeats are unbelievable. Um, and they constantly got to eat and feed on high, um, very high calorie um, foods. But they also are feeding all the time and basically like other birds are building up that fat on their bodies. So they're going from lean machines to basically miniature butter balls that just look like, like like bumblebees because they're so fat, all right? So what they are doing is they're building up those fat reserves so they can make these long trips um, without food. 
such as across the Gulf. All right. So still expending a lot of energy, but they've had those that, that fat reserve so tight and so large that uh, it helps them survive um, these long migrations without feeding. All right. And, and certainly long trips like over the Gulf of Mexico. So hopefully that answers your question, but you'll notice um, they, they put on a lot of weight uh, in relative to their body size and, and body mass just to, to get through these tough times where they basically got to burn fat because they can't feed. So hopefully that answers your question. All right, so um, let's, let's talk about some of the more um, interesting and maybe maybe even common migrants that we have in the Charlotte area. So the first one is truly a unique bird, the osprey. I'm sure most of you have seen them. They are our um, summer residents, spring and summer residents on our reservoirs. They like um, our lakes because there's a lot of very productive with fish and the water quality is nice and clean and clear. So they can see those fish. So the osprey uh, breeds up here and believe it or not, in 1980, we had zero ospreys in the Charlotte area. And um, interesting enough, they that's about the time, early 80s, they started moving up the coast, doing a little exploration and starting to be in some of their lower reservoirs, Moultrie, Marion, uh, Watery, and started moving up the Catawba River drainage. And then believe it or not, before I was even at Duke, um, Duke, Duke Energy, or Duke Power at that time, worked with the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission and basically put several juvenile hacked, basically put juvenile ospreys that were from Lake Madame Mesquite on the coast of North Carolina and put them in these little hacking sites on Lake Norman so they would get kind of imprinted on the lake and come the fall, come about October, late September, they took off, went down to the Amazon or the Caribbean or even Florida. Next year, believe it or not, all um, eight of them were back on Lake Norman. And that was one of the starts. Now we have over 400 ospreys on Lake Norman, um, probably another 300 um, on um, Wiley. Not so many up in James yet, but there's a few. But there's there are at least, based on our aerial surveys that we do on Norman there, and Wiley, there's, and Norman, there's at least 150 nests on Lake Norman right now. And a good bit of that is because of the Wildlife Federation and the uh, both the Gaston County Paws and the Lake Norman Wildlife Conservationists have started putting up nesting platforms for ospreys. Good benefit, one, it keeps them off man-made structures like power poles, which is, is not a good thing to have a bird in a nest on an electrical um, structure. And also keeps them off people's docks and marinas and um, channel markers. And it has also been very productive. And it's also, you know, you want to see something neat. The Lake Norman Wildlife Conservationist has a um, wildlife camera set up on an osprey nest. And also the heron rookery up on, up on Lake Norman. So you can watch the whole nesting process, the breeding, the nesting process, and the young. And then one day they're there. And one day they're just gone, you know. So they're all winging down back down to um, Chile, Florida, and the Caribbean, which depending on the distance is either from 400 miles to 4,500 4, miles of a migration route. So 4,000 miles, that's pretty much from here to, to um, California plus, all right? Ospreys are also very unique. Um, the only um, totally fish-eating raptor and they're also, you know, not just in North America, but they are worldwide, Africa, Russia, Canada, Europe, um, and certainly expanding in range. And I mentioned the 1980s. So also 
corresponding to that was stop using DDT. And you all know about that. Caused a calcium imbalance in the birds and they had very weak eggs. So when they were went to um, incubate their eggs and, and just was sitting on them with their bird weight, they crushed the eggs. So they had no, no recruitment. So both, you know, a lot of raptors, especially fish eaters like bald eagles and osprey suffered. DDT got banned and um, among other things and good conservation practices. And some of the reservoirs helped that bird come back uh, and it's very, very common now and, and a source of a lot of ecotourism around here right now. So, so generally it arrives in this area late March and April. I, I work over at the McGuire Nuclear Center at the Environmental Center there, and I can see them come. I know exactly when they come every year um, to the to the nests and the nest platforms, and it's always late March, um, sometimes early April. Depart anything from late August to um, late September, and like all hawks or raptors, they migrate at night. Or I'm sorry, migrate during the day. And like I said, there are just hundreds of, of the birds on Norman and Wiley now, all the way down the watery, and a few going up to Hickory and and up to Lake James now. So um, if you if you haven't seen an osprey, you just want to watch them. They're just very interesting, unique birds, um, like no other bird, not, like no other raptor. Um, and if you go to the coast, you can, you can see them diving on fish quite a bit. It's just a very fascinating bird to watch. All right. Um, and a very strong migrant. You can look at that picture and look at those wings and, and figure out that, that that's a good, that's a very strong migrant. Um, talk about a couple of neotropical, smaller neotropical birds. Um, blue gray gnat catcher. And he, that bird kind of looks like an angry mockingbird to me. Always kind of got that kind of interesting look to it with that black eyebrow. Um, one of the first migrants, that's why I've kind of put this in here. Um, winters in Florida, the Gulf Coast, again, Mexico, Central America. Also has a fairly, you know, from 200 miles to about 2,000 miles. Um, only the true migrant gnat catcher, kind of misnamed. It doesn't really eat gnats. It doesn't eat gnats. Um, but it does eat a lot of spiders and, and uh, um, small um, katydids and uh, moths, but doesn't eat gnats, by the way. Um, breeds in most eastern and western North America, deciduous forests, likes riparian bottomlands, wooded water body edges. Um, and because of climate change, most likely, its breeding range has, has been shifted north by several hundred miles over the last hundred years, all right? Um, so it can now be found um, well north of its original um, range uh, in the mid-Atlantic states. Like I said, it was one of the first early birds to migrate. Um, and we typically see it late March, late April, um, and also passes through Charlotte in August and September. And again, it's a, it's a day migrant. It's one of the day migrants. Now here's the, here's the hero of, of migration, or at least one of them, the black pole warbler. When I lived in Maine and worked in Maine, there, they are found fairly common up in the boreal spruce fir forests. Um, they pass through in the spring through the Charlotte area. I typically see quite a few. They're in, um, not quite in this um, black and white breeding plumage yet, but getting pretty close. This is the fall. You can see the big difference, all right, between the fall and the, the, the breeding and the, and the fall migra migratory pattern. Like most warblers, they, they, they change significantly, and that's why they call them confusing fall warblers, because there's a lot that look like that. But this bird um, winters up in the boreal forest, like I said, and uh, winters in, in South America, the Amazon basin, and breeds in the boreal forest with a route, my, migratory um, route of from 2,500 to um, more than 12,000 miles of a migration route, all right? Um, Passed it through Charlotte, like I said, early mid-May is when I eat, when I mostly see them or hear them, mostly. 
And there's no fall, fall migration passage through this part of the country because basically they, they um, have an overwater Atlantic passage, basically jump off from Maine or New Hampshire or Massachusetts and fly across the Atlantic Ocean, all right, all the way down to, say, um, South America or, the, or at least the Caribbean, all right? Night mag migrant, um, and uh, also believe it or not, it's a west to east fall migrant. Birds that winter, or I'm sorry, breed in say Manitoba or Alaska, fly across the country, get to the Atlantic Ocean, and then jump over the Atlantic Ocean to the South South America. So that's where the twelve thousand miles comes in. Significant amount of um, migration. They can even average 600, more than 600 miles a day on a 2,500 mile effort. And they've calculated that's more than 3 million wing flaps. And when they fly across the Atlantic Ocean, it's a 74 hour continuous flight over the ocean. So, so think about that. Put this in perspective. I think this is fascinating. So that's equivalent to us running a four minute mile for 80 consecutive hours, all right? Most of us can't even run a 10 minute mile or a 15 minute mile, but think about the energy use on that. Or if you wanna put it into a mechanical version, that's car mileage at um, 720,000 miles per gallon. So talk about efficiency. So all that is based on it building up all this fat mostly subcutaneous fat in the, in the breast area, all right? And up through, you know, um, like the saddle by the wings. So they're using fat to migrate over 74 hours of continuous flight, all right? They didn't have that fat build up or, you know, they're in some cases loss of habitat because of development has, has caused some um, micro, um, um, extinction in some areas because the birds just um, lose their habitat, can't build up those fat reserves and thus just die off because they can't make it. Um, so just kind of think, put that in perspective. I, I just think when I saw that kind of equivalency about with humans and cars, I just thought that was just unbelievable, you know, and put things in perspective of how what a phenomenon, how extraordinary this is, this, this avian migration for these birds. So anybody have any questions on that? Um, just incredible. People, people say, is that true? I always get questions, is that true? That can't be true. I said, it's true, it's true. I've double checked that. Um, I even checked with a, a couple scientists, avian or ornithologists on that. And they said, that's, that's pretty close to being exactly the equivalent of, of, of a human in those kind of situations, all right? Um, Scott, we do have one question. Um, yeah. You're gonna ask, what about robins? I see them here and yet in, I think that's Michigan, um, they would show up in March. Yeah, good question. Robins are very hardy, uh, one of the more hardier thrushes, all right? So they can be short-term migrants or they can be relatively long-term. Especially you get up to New England, uh, Upper Midwest. Um, you know, they're primarily, you know, both insect, worms, as you know, uh, fruits, berries. And when they go away or the ground's frozen, there's just no food. They can't deal with that. So, um, you know, if, if you go out to, say, the Alligator National Wildlife Refuge in spring and fall, you'll just see massive um, flocks of robins in some cases, all right? And or golf courses around here or the, or the coast. So um, they're all really tied to the habitat and the, and the conditions, but they're very hardy. So as soon as you know, things start to thaw out and the ground gets exposed, um, they'll, they'll move up in sometimes large flocks. Um, I see them around here sometimes all year, even in the winter, if we have a mild winter, but most of them winter, you know, on the coast or farther south where it's a bit warmer, you know, 
pretty much from South Carolina down to um, Louisiana, Florida, et cetera. But they'll, they'll um, migrate north as soon as things start thawing out or you get some warm spells, all right? So even if there's no insects or worms available, they'll they eat fruit, crab apples, um, hawthorns, holly berries, wax myrtle. Um, so Michigan is one of those areas, obviously well north, that if, if it's mild enough, they'll be there, but they typically get one of the first migrants to get up in those areas. And March is, you know, is, is certainly a pretty early for most birds, but th that's, a, that's a hardy bird, um, robins are. So, yeah, good question. All right, a couple more. Um, common yellow throat warbler, um, common around here, likes brushy areas again. Um, brushy scrub areas, wetlands, certainly, around Charlotte and all North Carolina, all right? Again, winters in the Caribbean, Mexico, Central America, like most neotropicals. Um, gets here about late March, again, April, and departs August, September, sometimes October. Um, like most warblers, very quiet in July, um, after the breeding season. Hardly, you see them a lot more hopping around, but you might hear a little chick call from them, but relatively quiet. And again, like all neotropical migrants or most warblers, you know, a night migrant. You can tell them by the by the yellow breast and the little whack or black uh, face mask they have on. Uh, another favorite around here, prothometary warbler. Wildlife Federation has put a um, considerable amount of boxes up for them. On, the only cavity nesting, you can see that picture there, cavity nesting um, warbler in this part of the of the world, country. Again, same kind of pattern, Caribbean, winters, Central America, Amazon, you know, up to a 3,000 mile migration route. Um, likes um, forested wetlands that are wet in riparian areas, um, Catawba River, um, shorelines of Norman where it's wooded and uh, most of the Piedmont coastal plain in North Carolina, not so much up in the mountains. Um, gets here about early April, departs August, late September. And uh, again, night migrant and typically travels about 20 to 100 miles a day. And, but also can fly like some of these, either relatively low if you got a low cloud ceiling but also up to 6,000 feet in altitude. So that's more than a mile up there. So um, when there were a lot of pilots, jet pilots are always fascinated because they see w birds up there, sometimes causing problems for their planes too. But um, they, the higher you go, they can, um, you got that kind of windy highway up there, relatively cool, although the oxygen is not as high as it may be lower, but they can, they can book up in those, up in that jet stream up there. So um, another little little mite of a bird that's flying at a 6,000 foot altitude, pretty incredible. Uh, another one that we see, um, North Carolina, the red start, American red start, another warbler. Always, you can always see, I saw a lot of these this fall, that little white patch flashing on its tail. They like to be by bird baths and sprinkler systems. They, they really like the water. Um, typical, you know, same kind of winter, Caribbean, South America, Amazon. Likes the hardwood and riparian habitats. And again, typical pattern like others. And you see a lot of these in mixed flocks, early April to parts of August, night migrant. And another one that flies, you know, a couple hundred miles a day and um, can fly at a very high altitudes, all right? And we're talking a, a small, very small bird, all right? Pretty fascinating just on that front on, a, on how high they can fly. Red-eyed vireo, uh, the vireo family, another neotropical migrant, certainly has a, a fairly large migratory route. Winters in the Amazon up to a 5,000 foot migration. Um, mostly Eastern and Midwestern North America. Um, I, we have them around here all year. 
and uh, relatively, you know, drabish green, usually up in the treetops, up in the canopy, but always known that vireo by that red eye, all right? Fairly common and typically one of the more earlier migrants that we get up here. Um, that and the blue-headed vireo, used to be called the solitary vireo. It's one of the first, sometimes we get those in March. But I've heard them in, in early to mid-April. Again, the parts, you know, September, October, and uh, like warblers, um, red-eyed vireos are night migrants. Um, here's everybody's favorite. We talked about the hummingbird. All right. Um, like we said, migrates all over the over the Gulf of Mexico, and typically a fairly long migration route. Likes hardwood wetlands. You know, certainly wetlands. It likes jewelweed. If you know what jewelweed is, um, wet and highly succulent wetland plant. People use it for the, to as an antidote for uh, or salve for poison ivy, and it's got those nice little your orange little flowers you see in September. Um, there's also the the uh, pale um, jewelry that's little little more rare that's yellow, but um, very. Um, um, common plant that hummingbirds love. This is a cardinal flower that they love also. Um, arrives in May, like I said, departs late September, early October, and all hummingbirds are day migrant. So during the migration, you'll see them zip by your head sometimes if you're out hiking or tri trout fishing. I see them in the fall all the time, just zipping down the, the river right by your head, you know. Um, pretty, pretty neat bird to, just to watch, just fascinating bird. Um, and there's, um, as you know, ruby-throated hummingbird is typically one of the only uh, hummingbirds we that breed west or east of the Mississippi. We also get a couple others um, that winter here um, in uh, the Carolinas and Georgia that come from out west. But the only, the only true breeding hummingbird um, east of the Mississippi. Now let's talk about a couple of swallows. Barn swallow, everybody knows, you know, all over the world, barn swallows are well known, aptly named, like human made structures. And then the, the northern rough wing swallow, which we have around here too. Um, rough wing swallows are pretty interesting because um, we have so many at the McGuire nuclear plant that I had to do a pipe survey and it, you can imagine what a nuclear plant pipe how many pipes they have but the the northern uh, the rough wing swallows were were nesting in all the different pipes and there were hundreds of them and the nuclear engineers were kind of freaked out that we were going to cause they were going to cause fires so i had to keep i had to develop a deterrent to keep them out of the uh, pipes that at the nuclear facilities and we had to put screening on our exhaust pipes on our trucks because they were trying to nest up in the exhaust pipes believe it or not there are so many so um breed we also have uh tree swallows now in this part of the country believe it or not they used to nest mostly up in the mid-atlantic in new england but we um they're starting to nest around wiley lake norman um up through um uh, Winston-Salem now. So pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and all swallows are day migrants. All right. And another bird that mostly winters or species or groups of species that winter mostly in Mexico, Costa Rica, and Belize. Whippoorwill, a bird that's um, in the goat sucker family. Um, Chuck Will's widows, night hawks, and quite a few species out west, but we have the whippoorwill, but um, I still hear them around, but they, they're they mostly when I'm up in the mountains in the spring. I once in a while hear one around here, but they're pretty much passing through, but they're on the uh, on the uh, decline right now. Most of those um, chuck wills, widows, and, and whippoorwills, mostly because of loss of habitat, both down in um, Mexico, but also up, uh, up up in this part of the country also. So like Eastern North American uh, hardwood mixed forests and relatively late 
arrival. Um, totally feeds on insects, flying insects. So you can imagine it's going to wait until all those insects are start uh, start to go out, um, take wing. Um, and then they, they migrate south late August, September, and sometimes you see huge flocks of them mixed in with night hawks and chuck wills, widows, et cetera, and some swallows. And uh, again, a day migrant. And then a couple more, I'll just talk about some uh, short distance migrants. Um, Yellow-billed sapsucker, yellow-bellied sapsucker. You can tell when they're around because they make these lateral drill holes on people's trees. My neighbors hate them. They always want to know um, why the woodpeckers go on their on their maples and their cherries and their birches. But they're aptly named because they drill those holes and, and get little sap wells and basically drink the sap off those trees. And also that sap attracts the insects that they feed on. So... Short, short distance migrant, um, breeds up in the, uh, up in, you know, Grandfather Mountain and um, elevations above 3,000 feet. And then winters down here in this area, I've seen a couple already, um, arrives typically in late August, um, I'm sorry, late October and departs April and May. And like I said, all woodpeckers are, are day migrants. A couple thrushes, hermit thrush. Um, several thrushes in North America. Hermit certainly winter down here. Um, mostly breed up in um, the northern north and north uh, northern North America, Mid Atlantic, New England, Canada. Um, but I've seen them hopping around. They're pretty silent about now. But you'll see this kind of um, you almost think it's like some kind of rodent running around. But it's it's typically a, a hermit thrush. Um, feed on a lot of berries right now. Like I mentioned, you know, hawthorns or waxy berries and any insects they can find. And sometimes we'll go on your suet also. I've seen that happen a couple of times. Again, like a lot of migrants, it's a night migrant. All right. Thrushes are night migrants, including robins for the most part. Another short distance is the yellow rumped warbler or in the, in the bird birding world known as the butter butt because of that yellow patch. Um, common bird, you see them in your feeders, they eat suet, they love on the coast the wax myrtle fruits, all right, and typically in these mixed foraging flocks of bluebirds, chickadees, titmice, um, purple finches, they like to fly around, it's, there's an advantage of that because, you know, one bird may be on the ground, one bird may be on the trunk, one bird may be in a tree, they all help each other, you know, um, find food. Um, so they like these kind of mixed foraging fo flocks. So you'll come and see um, yellow warblers, or as they were known when I was a kid, myrtle warblers um, in your backyard about now and all winter. All right. Um, breed up in the boreal forest, northern um, North America. And again, is a night migrant. So if you ever get out in the morning and I get up and run about 4.30 in the morning, typically, I can hear birds migrating at night and just go out one night and you'll hear um, check notes uh, way up in the, in the uh, uh, sky. And that's the call notes that warblers and thrushes are using to kind of keep themselves all together. Um, let them know that we're all flying, we're all good and uh, kind of let every, all the birds know where each other is so they don't kind of run in, into each other. But so interesting, go out early morning or in the evening and just listen on a clear night and you can hear birds migrating over um, using these call notes. And the yellow rump warbler is one of those. I talked about the white-throated sparrow. Um, very common in the Charlotte area. Southeast United States has got one of the largest wintering populations in North America. Um, you know, they breed up everywhere from Boreal, Canada, down through Maine, New York State, Adirondacks, Pennsylvania, um, northern West Virginia, up in the Appalachian Mountains. And then they usually get here by clockwork, typically uh, mid to late October and depart April and May. And like I said, sparrows are all um, night migrants, all right? So you could be out in the yard, don't see any one day, wake up the next morning and your whole 
your whole uh, yard is is um, covered with singing um, um, white-throated sparrows. If you're if you're a, a United States resident, their call sounds like poor Sam Peabody Peabody. But if you're a Canadian resident, it sounds like oh sweet Canada, sweet Canada. So you you kind of know what part of the country they're from by by that dialect. So when I lived in Maine, that's what the Canadians used to always say. They said we don't use poor Sam Peabody, we use oh sweet Canada. I said okay, that sounds that. Good way to remember. So, so that's a white throat sparrow, known for that nice white throat and that little yellow um, kind of uh, eyebrow there. All right, very common. Pine siskin, we kind of talked about short distance migrant, relative of the goldfinch, same same um, family. Um, breeds up in the northern um, mountains of North Carolina, Appalachian high elevation, and pretty common at our feeders, likes black oil sunflower and, and, and niger thistle. Um, typically can be seen night migrant also, um, gets here about November, January, departs April. Usually found with goldfinches at your feeders. Um, and, and sometimes found in Charlotte. I haven't seen any yet, but I've heard a couple fly over. Um, and a lot of the Northern um, breeding birds or eruptive, like I mentioned. So when the spruce fir um, pine seed crop fails up in boreal North America, we get a lot down here. So there's some years are all over the place. So just kind of um, similar to a goldfinch, but keep, keep an eye on that, those kind of wing bars and that coloration and you'll probably have a pine siskin. Um, I mentioned the common loon. Again, another bird that wasn't here a couple decades ago used to fly all the way down to the coast in the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast, but now short short stops in our lakes and reservoirs. So get a chance, go on one of those loon tours, all right? Eats, eats primarily and always eats fish, small fish about one to three inches long, breeding plumage on the top, breed up in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and then here's the winter plumage that we see on our lakes. Always know by the low profile and the long like rapier-like beak so it can catch fish. Green plumage, beautiful green, speckled black and white, and a very red eye. And just quickly, I know we're getting a little late here. So uh, Bonaparte's gulls, very common now on Lake Norman, almost like a turn-like small bird always known by this kind of ashy patch behind its ear, or I'm sorry, at its ear behind its eye, and the black uh, wing tips. Um, very common, I've already seen qu quite a few on Lake Norman right now. Breeds up in the boreal muskeg, up in the tundra, and then gets down here about November, December, parts, departs late April. And if you're a fisherman or know somebody that is, a lot of fishermen on Lake Winter, fishermen in Lake Norman, look for the birds, follow the birds, and these birds are picking up bait fish that the game fish push up, and they'll flock. You'll see them wheeling around, flocking all over the place. Fishermen use those to find where the striped bass and the hybrids and the bass are. So the the, the rule is follow the birds, and you'll you'll get bring home some fish for the night. A couple waterfowl species. That's the lesser scalp found down here, um, short distance migrant, breeds up in the some of the prairie potholes area. Um, the, as I said, the duck factory gets down here again, that peak north waterfowl period, November, December, um, departs March. Waterfowl are either day or night migrants, they, they migrate either end. It doesn't seem to bother them. Um, Red-breasted merganser, pretty common. You know, long thin meganser, you know, fish eating serrated fishing bill, always kind of known by that messy, there's messy, messy feathers on its head. Um, winter's here and gets here about November, December, and then breeds up in the boreal North America in the potholes and small ponds. <clears throat> Double crested cormorant, typically. We didn't have these around, but now they're starting to uh, winter quite a bit. Lake Norman, Hickory, um, 
Fishing Creek Reservoir and Watery Reservoir in South Carolina. Um, mostly breeds up in um, northern um, North America, um, like in the Great Lakes. But we're starting to find some new co breeding colonies down here, like in Lake Hickory now. So um, they just find that clear water and all that abundant fish. That's they, they just eat fish. They're, they're deeper divers like the loons. They're not surface feeders like the gulls are. So that's a, just a kind of a snapshot of some of the migrants. So kind of in closing, you know, what can you do to help migrant birds or, or just wildlife in general? And I know you guys all are well aware of, of a lot of these, but, you know, plant, grow native plants. Wildlife Federation is a prime proponent for um, pollinator plants and planting na natives. I just heard Madison talk about some of the trees for trash were, programs we're doing. I know um, Union County Wildlife Chapter has done some tree planting, so keep up the good work. Provides a lot of good habitat and forage for birds. Um, seek other options to pesticides whenever you can in your backyard. I'm a little, he little hesitant on the next bullet about talking about cats. I, I have nothing against cats, by the way, but you know, feral cats and cats that are let out um, kill a lot of uh, birds annually and small mammals and reptiles. Put feeders out. We talked about some feeders um, earlier, especially in the winter. Um, certainly augment, you know, the food supply out there. Suet, peanut butter, Niger seed, black oil, sunflower seed, and cracked corn are some of the best um, seed mixes. Keep a good supply of clean water out there so they can bathe and, and drink even in the winter. Um, make sure you put a bird box up, you put a predator guard on because it's a death trap if you don't. Black snakes get in there. I've, I've watched them get in the blue bird boxes and just just gobble down whatever's in that box. So you got to put those predator, predator guards up on any bird box. Um, volunteer, get outside on, on World Migratory Bird Day, which is typically about uh, mid-May. I don't have to tell you guys about this, but join conservation organizations, stay informed about current conservation efforts, Habitat and Birds, um, Wildlife Federation, the local chapters, and we have, uh, I think about 20 now, at least, or almost 20. Um, National Audubon Society, Nature Conservancy, there's just a wealth of good conservation organizations out there. And, you know, just as importantly, get outside, you know, even now, you know, we can, we can go out social distance and still do some good bird walks, see some wintering birds, get some fresh air, get some exercise. And a couple other, you know, ways to donate, you know, you do your taxes, um, do the non-game uh, endangered wildlife fund checkoff. All right. You know, donate $10. That all goes to the non-game, including the Partners in Flight pro, um, program that the Wildlife Resource Commission or the South Carolina DNR has. So um, do that check, check off, check off. You can even do that now when you do it file electronically in most um, of those tax companies. And a lot of people don't know is buy a duck stamp. You don't have to be a duck hunter. So you buy a federal duck stamp and they're about $36, I think. All, most of that money goes into um, wetland habitat protection, protection and uh, avian bird habitat, duck habitat, so management. So um, buy a duck stamp. They're, they're always very beautiful. They're all painted um, pictures that... Um, that are just incredible when you look at you, they look like photographs. So you can get them at the post office, you can order them online, um, but some, just another good way to donate to uh, conservation. And then quickly, I just wanna talk about, you don't have to go far to um, observe, observe migrants. We have all Mecklenburg County, Union County, we have great parks, all right? Uh, up this way, we got Jaton Park, Lake Norman. We got Lake Norman State Park, um, Latta Park and Preserve. That's where I, I'm right near there, a couple miles. That's where I, I do a lot of hiking and walking and bird watching and running and stuff. So um, beautiful area, a lot of great habitats. Reedy Creek, um, closer to you. Um, 
Cowan's Ford Wildlife Refuge, which is up this way. This is one of the pictures right here on the lower um, right of the one of the observation towers. You can look over a prairie restoration site and a couple ponds and some hardwood forest. Um, Matthews, you got Squirrel Lake Park, Four Mile Creek Greenway, Crowder's Mountain. Um, they should call it Crowded Mountain now because so many people are getting out, but great place to, to hike, um, see a lot of good birds, um, and a good place to hawk watch. Matter of fact, in the, in the fall at about September 20th, a lot of broad wing hawks and falcons and eagles are flying by. So a good place for that. And then you don't have to go far, just go in your backyard. All right. Um, I see more birds in the backyard. I don't have to go far. Got some nice mature trees. Most people do. Or a greenway nearby. So you don't have to go far to get outside, get some exercise, and do some good bird watching. And pretty cheap. All you got to do is have a good pair of shoes, um, binoculars, maybe a little insect repellent. Get up early, maybe a cup or two of coffee or tea to get you going. But pretty minimal um, effort needed to just get out there and enjoy um, birds and enjoy migration, just get some fresh air and just enjoy nature. So, um, so there's, this is just a snapshot of places to go. I know down your way, you got uh, some, you got greenways and you, you got some good parks and lakes down there. So you don't have to go far just to get outside and get a little fresh air, which is important anytime, but certainly important now. Um, to keep up, keep that up and, and uh, um, get a little exercise and enjoy nature. So, so that's, that's, uh, I'm pretty much out of, uh, out of my voice here. So um, I, I sent a copy of this presentation to Brianna. So um, she, she has, and I think Tara has a copy too. So um, feel free, if you got questions, you know, you can get up with Tara or, or Brianna, think about something. Or, or you can just give me a call. Um, there's my my contact number, my cell phone, and my uh, my email. And uh, just for your free, you got questions, need some help, um, need some information, just want to chat. I'm a pretty friendly guy, so um, love to talk to you about any of this stuff. And um, I'll make it an effort. You guys, you know, Union County uh, Wildlife Chapter is. I know is um, one of my favorite local chapters. So I certainly want to be involved. So I'll, I'm going to keep in, keep up on all your uh, projects. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to helping you out on some of these and um, coming to your meetings also and, and joining in on your meetings. So, so appreciate it, everybody. Um, thank you for joining in. Thanks for being a member of the Wildlife Federation if you aren't. Um, please get online and, and join up. It's a wonderful organization and you'll, you'll benefit from it. And so will um, wildlife conservation and, and habitat. So please, please think about that. Um, you want a good Christmas gift for somebody or for yourself? You know, no need to uh, go out and go too far to buy something. Just get, get online and become a member. So so everybody, I hope everybody uh, enjoys the, the holidays, has a great time, take some time off, get outside, and uh, please stay uh, safe and stay healthy. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, before you go, I think we did have a few questions. Um, sure. Karen wanted to know why gulls come inland in the winter. Well, that... That's a, a good question. So another recent phenomena is because of these reservoirs. Um, we've never, I just wrote an article for the Angler magazine on, on gulls and, and flocking birds on our reservoirs and why, they're, why fishermen use them, but also the uh, um, concept of just general bird flocking. But um, Relatively new phenomena, but they love all these large reservoirs, whether it's, you know, um, up in the mountains to a little less extent, but the Piedmont, especially in the coast, like Jordan, um, Jordan Lake and Everett, um, uh, Falls, Falls Creek, is it Falls Creek Lake? Um, anyway, um, 
those lakes in the Durham area has have up to 50,000 ringbill gulls wintering every winter. Norman has up to about 15,000. And it's, they're there because one, it's nice and open. They're, they're protected uh, from a lot of predation, but also um, good water quality, water's clear and very large population of small bait fish, forage fish. Um, alewives, blueback herring, shad, and it's just um, a perfect um, wintering area where all those factors. So, like I said, we got several species of galls, sometimes get some very rare ones on storms. Um, we've even had some rare birds like white pelicans relatively recently on a uh, blue wind from uh, uh, some of these winter storms. So, um, the reason they're here is because one, we got large bodies of water, a lot of fish, and relatively clear um, water so they can see the fish to, to feed on. So good, good question. Thank you on that, Karen. Was there another question, Brianna? Yes, um, I actually had a question. Oh, so. Yeah. Is there anywhere that you are there any sources or resources out there where you can actually look and see um, what species are in your area at a certain time? So if I wanted to know what migratory birds were coming through the area right now, is there anywhere that um, that I can find that? Yeah. So one of the one of the good sources there's there's a couple of rare bird alerts for one. Um, and I'm sorry, I must have skipped a slide. I want to show you a slide of um, somehow in my ineptitude and in going through this slide deck. I missed a slide I want to show you uh, on how it's studied. But one of the ways you can figure out when migration is, is happening is go to www.weather.gov and go to the next rad basically next generation radar, weather surveillance radio, uh, radar. And you can look at when birds are starting to move up. These, these are all birds coming off uh, Fort Polk in Louisiana during fall migration um, at about um, sunset. So they actually use NEXRAD radar now to track um, bird migration. So you, you won't get the species, but you can get a pretty good idea of when it's coming through your area. Um, this is just another radar I used for some uh, wind energy projects up in Maine. These are actually, the, so you can see the tracks of the migratory birds over the top of the mountains. Um, but to get to your point, a, a good source is the Carolina Bird Club. You can get them online. And you can go into sightings and you can see what birds are coming, what people see by the date. All right. So they'll see, you can go on there and look at December 10th. And you can see um, all the birds that were seen that people reported from Asheville to, to uh, Cape Hatteras. All right. Um, common birds, rare birds, etc. So it kind of gives you a good idea of what's, being seen in the area, all right? Um, the Charlotte area is in there quite a bit too. Piedmont areas, you know, Salisbury or Winston-Salem or um, um, Belmont. I see Belmont in there sometimes. So people call in and report their bird sighting. So that's a, that's a good way to, to uh, um, look at what birds are, are starting to wing into the area or, or leave. Carolina Bird Club, all right? You don't have to be a member to get, them on, get it online. Um, you can be a member, but you can you can go to sightings or reports, all right, and kind of check that out. Okay, thank you. Yep, sure. Yep. Um, I think that is all of the questions. So thank you again for the presentation and um, for everyone who is still on the call. Feel free to reach out to myself or Tara if you have any other questions. All right. Thank Very you, so good. great. I just want to thank everyone for being on the call as well. Thank you for being members and for being a part of this. I appreciate it. Scott, as always, super interesting info. And thank you, Brianna and the Union Wildlife Chapter for hosting.